Good morning, Westminster Church, and welcome. Every pastor I've checked, every pastor has either had it happen or has had a dream that they are late for a service. Um, I preached at the Meridian Church when I was a student in seminary, and we lived in McCandless, and Meridian Church was like, you know, up near Pimatuming. To go to Meridian Church was just back 20-some 20, 20 years ago. I didn't know where it was. And I'm driving there, and I'm convinced that I'm an hour late. Um, Tom got stuck in traffic in some celebration. Um, of course, I also knew a woman in seminary who was the worship leader at an Episcopal church in Slippery Rock, and they had a guest preacher one Sunday, and it was Marathon Sunday. And the guest preacher got stuck on the other side of town. So she led a hymn sing at the Episcopal Church in Swickley because this guy never made it. And as it turns out, after the worship service, God called her to seminary. So be careful in case somebody doesn't show up. So I'm driving on Rochester Road this morning and I looked at the clock on my car and it said 1048. And then I realized it was 948. So I'm glad to be here. Um, Romans 8.22, creation waits in agony. Because of sin, creation is broken. We have tsunamis, we have wildfires, we have earthquakes, because creation is broken. And yet, when Christ comes again, creation will be redeemed. All of creation will be redeemed. I was at, uh, in Oakland one day in April, and the, at St. Paul's Cathedral, they have tulips out there. And the priest was out there tending the tulips. And I went over to him and I said, Romans 8.22, creation waits in agony. And he looked at me like I was reading the tax code. <laughs> so you think it's beautiful now. Just wait, folks. It's going to be great when we get to heaven and creation is redeemed. I'm glad to be here. Um, I get to preach three weeks in a row. Three weeks in a row. So please come back next week now that you know I'm preaching three times. Steve. Good morning. So on behalf of the transition team, um, pleased to announce this will be the last time one of us will stand up here and talk about the transition team and report. Um, so we have just about completed our work to the transition team. Uh, I was to get the kind of semi-polished version of the self-study to you. Uh, I'm just about there. It will be out today, I promise you. Uh, I'm just about done with it. Um, so look for that uh, in your email, um, and I'll you know, state it in the email as well do a review uh, of that transition team uh, self-study um, and then get that back to uh, Jim, uh, well, to, you know, to everyone, uh, your, your thoughts and uh, um, that, that part of the uh, phase will be done. So then we look forward to the next um, phase, which would be the uh, forming of the pastor nominating committee. Thank you. Sorry, Lou, one more thing. The first hymn has been changed we will be singing, Lord, guard and guide the men who fly. The words are on the screen. Eric will play the tune through once. So I guess it's, it'll become familiar to us. And the second hymn is Eternal Father, Strong to Save. I think that's what it is. And that's 521 in the red hymnal. So two changes in the hymns, but we'll make it. So I know a lot of you have expressed your concern about my health, and I, I again want to say thank you for your prayers, thank you for your well wishes, thank you for the cards and the emails. It's been uh, um, very encouraging. So the uh, final, uh, I'll, I'm, I've been kicking around whether I want to do a public service announcement here, and I think I do. So the, uh, uh, the concern was, you know, Tom, what do you have? Did you have kidney stones? And really, was that the only thing? 
Well, as it turns out, uh, there's a thing called anaplasma. And anaplasma, he's shaking his head, anaplasma is uh, a, a, a condition that the people can get when they've been infected with anaplasmosis. There's a test later. So anaplasmosis is <laughs> transmitted by deer ticks. So I had apparently at some point been bitten by a deer tick. I'm fairly, at least I thought I was, fastidious about making sure that I check myself. But apparently somewhere along the line, one got to me and I didn't realize it. So this uh, anaplasma is uh, the new and the greatest sort of uh, bacteria that they're carrying. And it is, folks, do not screw around. Six days in the hospital with 104 fever, you don't want to be there. It is, uh, it is, it is life-threatening, and apparently uh, it's not that quickly diagnosed. So, uh, but what the good news is once they figure it out, it's pretty easy to fix. It's the same... Uh, My brain just quit, but it, it's the same antibiotic that they use for uh, Lyme's disease, and yeah, so, but this is the time of the year, spring and fall, when black-legged ticks, so that's the deer tick, are busy looking for, excuse me for saying it, but it's called a blood meal, and they're out there looking to get something to eat, and they're happy to get it from a deer, Happy to get it from a mouse, happy to get it from anything that's passing by, including you and me. So be aware, beautiful outside, wonderful. Enjoy the outdoors, be, be present in God's world, but check for ticks. All right, and, end of public service announcement. If you will, please stand and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll begin to worship God with our call to worship. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. You trust in princes, in mortal men, who cannot say, when their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is in the Lord of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord, who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteousness. Our first hymn is Lord God and Guide the Men Who Fly.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray together the prayer of confession. O oh God, you are victorious. Your reign is sure in both heaven and on earth. Through Christ, your coming kingdom has been established. Forgive us for living timid lives of submission to fear and the powers of this world. We do not act like the subjects of a victorious Lord. Forgive our reluctance to speak of your reign in our lives. We hesitate to submit all of our lives to your will. We turn away from opportunities in which we can serve you by serving those who are broken and bruised. Forgive and restore us. Send your Holy Spirit to empower us for ministry in our unique time and place. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's take a moment and silently confess our sin before God. The prophet declares, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like wool. Though they are of crimson, they shall be as white as snow. My friends, believe the good news of the gospel. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the very beginning, the first 14 verses. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of the blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is a reading from the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. come? All right. Hi, guys. Oh, 
thank you, sweetie. All right. Have you guys ever seen a quarter? Yeah. Okay, and what, what do you see on the quarter? Do you know who this is? George Washington, very good. How do you think George Washington got on my quarter? Yep. Yep, that, very good. He was the first president. But why did, but how did he, how did his face get on my quarter? How did his picture, his likeness, get on my quarter? How do you think? Okay, you guys are thinking not quite literal enough. How did somebody take a piece of metal and imprint the image onto the quarter? Yes. Yes. And did you know that that special machine has a special name? And in Greek, that tool has a special name that is translated to character. So the special tool that is used to put the likeness of George Washington on my quarter is called a character. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And do you know that God sent a character to the world? Do you know who that is? Who is it? Who is it? Jesus, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just like... Jesus, God sent Jesus to us to show God's character to the world. So what are some things that Jesus showed us about God? What do you guys think? You can just shout them out. He makes people, but what, what kind of attributes? Like, was he, I don't know, friendly? You think he was friend generous? That's a good one. What else? Caring, yep. Loving, very good. Giving. What else? Kind, yep. We read in the scripture for the sermon this morning from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that... He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint, the Greek word for character, of God's very being. So just like the quarter will show us what George Washington looked like, Jesus shows us what God looks like. So if you ever kind of wonder what God is like, you can look in your Bible and look at all the wonderful stories about Jesus and what Jesus did, and you'll know what God's like. Will you pray with me? God, as we want to know more like you, we thank you so much for giving us the greatest example ever to know how we want to be and to be more like you. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, you can return to your seats.
You may be seated. Before I forget, um, my children's sermon in two weeks includes chocolate. So if there's, the parents, if there's an issue with chocolate, please let me know. Okay, I won't have peanuts. Please let me know. Let's have a prayer. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your work. And Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This week and the next two weeks, I have three very important sermons. This week, I'd like us to consider the humanity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll look at the work of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And on November 21st, I want us to consider how we respond to these things. How do we respond to this? How do we respond to the person, the divinity, and the work of Christ? Now, many churches, as you know, have an annual tradition in November. Each year, the pastor dusts off what I call the Sermon on the Amount. The Sermon on the Amount. The annual stewardship sermon. Now, before you start thinking three sermons on stewardship, if we were to preach on stewardship as often as Jesus spoke about money, you would hear 13 sermons per year. All they do is talk about money. This is not about money. This is about your response to the person of Christ and the work of Christ. Maybe pledge cards are mailed to your home. Perhaps members give testimonies about how they love the church. Maybe some talking head gets up and talks about the budget and how things might have to be reduced if you don't step up. Maybe an elder or two visited your home. I mean, we did the saddlebag thing 100 years ago. This year, I want you to think differently about stewardship. This year, I'm asking each of us, myself included, to pray about, to think about what God might be calling you, God might be encouraging you, or God might be commanding you, how much God might be commanding you to give back to the body of Christ called Westminster United Presbyterian Church. Contrary to what you might think, what you've been told, or what your history might be, what you give each week to Westminster Church is not a referendum on the budget. It's not a referendum on the leadership or the pastor. It's not about paying bills. It's not about what might be happening in the presbytery or in the denomination. It's not about stepping up like you do with WQED or the Boy Scouts. It's not about me or Tom. And it's certainly not about you. It's about Christ. Stewardship, how much we give back to the church, is an important, essential response to our It's a response to the eternal promise, the birth, the life, the ministry, the betrayal, the unfair trial, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the eventual return of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Have you ever taken time to think about this thing called stewardship? What do you believe about this thing in your Christian life? How does your life, how does your entire life demonstrate that response? Sometimes we're in need of a little theological refresher. Why do we worship anyhow? Why do we get up each Sunday morning and come to church? Much more important, What is our physical response?
to Jesus Christ. With all this in mind, let's turn to our second reading this morning. It's in your bulletin. These are, in my opinion, 106 of the most amazing words to be found in Scripture. If you've never read the letter to the Hebrews, I encourage you to do it. It'll take you about half an hour. It is a phenomenal Christological statement. Um, I'm not here long enough. I've uh, gone through the book of Hebrews twice in two churches, North Branch Church. It took me 22 weeks. 22 weeks in Hebrews. Yes, 22 weeks in Hebrews. It is phenomenal. You will be knocked down by the letter to the Hebrews. So let's read the first four verses, and then we will go through it. Listen to the word of God. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory. Thank you, Lizzie. He's the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Verse 1. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways through the prophets. This passage is another example of how sometimes the intent and the beauty of the original language is lost in translation. The English is beautiful, but the original Greek, the words leap off the page. Years ago... Many of you, some of you may know I worked for a German company for 20 years. I was fluent in German. And my wife and I went to a symphony, and they had a little choir there, and they sang some poems that had been put to mu- some Goethe poems that had been put to music by Mendelssohn. And the one poem was about a father putting his little boy to bed. I have two sons. I remember that. The one's about to become 43. That's another story. But the father's putting his little boy to bed. The English is totally flat, but the German brings tears to your eyes. It's phenomenal. In this verse, the author is simply not introducing theological concepts, but he is beginning a wonderful sermon on the deity, the person, the work, and the eternal nature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right out of the gate, we are confronted with the reality of God and the fact that God has been active through history. The first divine activity is that God speaks in many and various ways. He spoke to Moses in the burning bush, to Elijah in a still, small voice, to Isaiah in a vision in the temple. He spoke to Job out of a storm to Hosea in family circumstances, and he spoke to Amos in a basket of fruit. As we all know, he speaks to us today. God conveys his message, visions and dreams, angels, symbols, natural events, ecstasy, a a pillar of fire, smoke, or other means. He appears to us in the Ur of the Chaldees, Iran, Canaan, Egypt, Babylon, even Evan City, Pennsylvania. There's no lack of variety. Revelation is not a monotonous activity that always takes place in the same way. God speaks to us many times. The process is a continuous one, and we continually received an ever-present revelation from God. The translation in the in the Bulletin, it uses the word long ago. Others say or of, uh, of old or in the past. The revelation of God has deep roots in history. Verse 2, but in these, day, in these last days he has spoken to us by a son 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. When the author refers to these last days, he's referring to the new age of the Messiah, Jesus. Verse 1 says, through the prophets. Verse 2, he says, by a son. More literally, it should read, in one who has the quality of being son. Jesus is more than just the last in a line of prophets. If you only believe that, you're either Muslim or Jewish. Jesus was just a prophet, not the Son of God. Jesus has inaugurated a new age altogether. The author now introduces, after these first two verses, eight propositions about Jesus, eight things. First proposition, as we just read in verse 2, Jesus has been appointed heir of all things. He is creator, and by his death, he has been given dominion over everything. As we share in his inheritance, we also share, as we share in his resurrection, we also share in his inheritance. Second proposition, through Jesus, God made the universe. Our translation says worlds, but the Greek actually means the universe. And it's not just what we know of the universe, as vast as that is. The term rendered the universe is literally the ages and has a sense of time. It means, quote, the sum of the periods of time, including all that is manifested in them. Now we take verse 3 and divide it up a little bit. He is the reflection of God's glory. The sun reflects the glory of God. A better translation is in the NIV. It says the sun is the radiance of God's glory. He is the source of God's glory. Second part of verse 3, and the exact imprint of God's very being. The fourth proposition, Jesus is the exact imprint. He bears the very stamp of God's nature. Or being. Some translations say, and the exact representation of God's being. In the Greek, as Lizzie mentioned, it refers to the image on a coin. Essentially, the Son is such a revelation of the Father that when we see Jesus, we see God's real being. I came across a quote, I don't have any idea where it came from. Without Christ, Without Christ, God becomes a reflection of ourselves. Without Christ, God becomes a reflection of ourselves. And another one I found was, if God didn't exist, we'd have to invent one on our own. If God didn't exist, we'd have to invent one. We would invent one. I think there was Voltaire, I'm not sure. But without, if you want to know God, look at Christ. Thank you, Pastor Wolf. Sometimes the children's sermon better than the real thing. You guys will decide that when I'm done. But please don't leave after the children's sermon. But without Christ, God becomes a reflection of ourselves. Last part of verse 3, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. The fifth proposition, Jesus is the sustainer of the universe. Not Atlas holding the earth on his shoulders, but that power which holds the eternal functioning of the cosmos together. The literal translation is carrying along. Christ is carrying us along towards a goal, and that goal is the redemption of all creation, Romans 8.22. Not only has the Son created the world and the universe, but the Son continues to supply it with the very force that keeps it all together. Otherwise, its elements would disengage in a sudden and catastrophic separation. Now, now we're getting to the really important stuff, if such a distinction can be made from the first four things that we've come up with, five, fifth things. The sixth and seventh, finishing verse 3. When he had made purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
With the statement about the sons having made purifications for sins, the anonymous author comes for him what is the heart of the matter and should be for us as well. The author is completely overwhelmed by the very fact that the Son of God has come to deal with the sin of humanity once and for all. The author sees Jesus as a priest, a theme that runs through the letter of Hebrews, and the essence of the priestly work as the offering of the sacrifice that really and finally puts sin aside. The word purification, katharismos, from where we get our word catharsis, cathartic, is most often used in the New Testament for ritual cleansing. But here it refers to the removal of sin. Also, the tense in the Greek of sin means that Christ took away sin rather than us simply being cleansed from sins. Paul talks about forgiveness without regret. In Christ, through Christ, by Christ, our sin is sin finally removed. Seventh, Jesus sat down at the right hand of God in the majesty of heaven. Sitting is a posture of rest. And in the right hand position is the place of honor. Sitting at God's right hand is a way of saying that Christ's saving work is done and now he is now in the place of highest honor. The word majesty obviously refers to God the Father himself. We'll be saying that in a few minutes. And the last proposition, verse 4, having become become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited more than theirs. So he's seated at the right hand of God and he's superior to any angels. As I was preparing this sermon, I read a chapter in a commentary. It said, Jesus was no angel. That gets your attention. Again, these are four of the most phenomenal verses in Scripture. One commentator writes, the language here is so lofty that it bears little resemblance to the Jesus we know in the Gospels. Yes, as the children said, he was loving, he was kind. You read some of the stuff, he told a good joke. I guess there's something something hilarious about a camel going through the eye of a needle. He was generous, this, that. But, folks, he is not the big guy in the sky. He's not the man upstairs. And he is certainly not your co-pilot. Because if he's your co-pilot, you're in the left seat. I am in the back, in the middle seat of a DC-9, right in front of the restroom, last row. That's where I am on the plane, and Christ is in the pilot's seat. Yeah, God is not your co-pilot, because that makes you the pilot. I'm in coach in the last row. So, eternal word, heir of all things, creator of the universe, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God, provided purification for sins, now seated at the right hand, hand of the majesty in heaven. Did I miss the radiance of God's glory? Let me repeat that. Sorry. Eternal word, heir of all things, creator of the universe, radiance of God's glory, exact representation of God, provided purification for sin, now seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and superior to any angel his name above all names. My friends, God himself, Jesus Christ, died on the cross so we have the promise of eternal life. And eternal life does not begin when you die. The operative word is eternal. You know, Nipsey Russell, everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die. Eternal life begins when you receive and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Boom. Jesus Christ died for you and me. What I want you to do as your coach or part-time, eight to ten hours a week pastor, 
We're operating with one hand behind our back. You're experiencing life in Christ with one hand behind your back. Maybe your fingers are crossed. Live life to the fullest. That's my sermon in two weeks. I want you to hear, this is a comment from a, he, a commentary on the Hebrews from Lewis Evans. I met him. It's comment, uh, a commentary on Hebrews. Whenever the church loses its sense of awe or wonder or excitement, the church begins to atrophy. You become weak. To handle heavenly revelation with dispassionate attitude or cool rationalism is to deny its transforming power. It is distressing today that the church is so seldom excited or overwhelmed with Jesus. One feels in certain ecclesiastical circles that, it, circles that enthusiasm for Christ is beneath the, dis, the sophisticated disciple. Yet as we view the history of the church, we see clearly that a lessened Christianity means a correspondingly lessened church. When we bleach the banners of apostolic brilliance, few desire to march under its color. On the other hand, when the church rediscovers the magnificent Christ and is overwhelmed by his godly person and sacrificial atonement, the church becomes alive. May the Holy Spirit bring it back to our remembrance and understanding, magnifying Jesus Christ so powerfully that once again we are smitten and enthusiastic beyond control. One way for this church to get excited is for us to be excited about Jesus Christ and what he did. You're all nice folks. We're all nice folks. But the only reason we're going to heaven is because of Jesus Christ dying for me and you. I'm a nice person. You are. But we are doomed without Christ. Accept that. And be shocked, shocked, shocked that God died for me and you. Shocked. Sorry. Shocked. It's astonishing. that God, I've been a pastor for 20 years. I'm amazed that the church survives. If you were a nonprofit organization, you would have gone out of business years ago. But because you're the body of Christ, you're here. If Tom and I do nothing else, one person, Jesus Christ, thank you very much for saving my rear end. It's not in my script. If I make you mad, I apologize. But if God convicts you and makes you shocked and astonished, I came to Christ, it was a slap in the face, a slap in the face at the kitchen table Sunday morning. Be amazed that God died for you. Be shocked and respond. Respond. Not just with cool rationalism, and, but be enthusiastic. And what will happen is visitors come into this place and you will show them we are glad to be here. We love this place, and we are enthusiastic about Jesus Christ, and we're glad you're here too. And this place will fill up, regardless of your parking. This is who Jesus is. Next week, it's what he did for us. The sermon title is, He Saved Us. He saved us. Be shocked. Let's pray. Lord God, let us be amazed with the very, the truth, the undeniable truth that Jesus Christ came to earth as a human, didn't have to, he willingly left his heavenly throne and became human and obedient as a slave and he died for me, for us. 
Heavenly Father, if there is anyone here today who just is for whatever reason coming to grips with that truth for the first time in their lives, open the door of their heart and Holy Spirit enter them. Enter that person and fill them with the grace of forgiveness and eternal life. For those of us who have received this promise days or years before, let that promise be renewed and refreshed with the astonishing truth of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And Lord God, give us the courage to respond as you would have us respond, enthusiastically embracing that convicting truth of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us all stand and say what we believe as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We changed a little bit to honor our veterans, those who have served, those who we remember, those who we honor. It is a, uh, a time of, of uh, joy that we can come together to celebrate our veterans and all that they have done for us. Uh, this morning I will light the center candle. I will remember some names, um, honor some people, and then I'll invite all of you, as you wish, to come forward to pick a candle, to hold it, to light it, to set it down, and to speak a name of a veteran or veterans that you may know. We'll begin with a prayer of litany that hopefully will be behind me. We pause to remember those who go to war in our name. Remind us, O oh God, that the goal of any war need be justice and peace. On this day, we pause and worship to give thanks to God for veterans. And seek to bind up the wounds of those who have served. Enable us to know how to comfort, how to bind up their wounds. And remind us, dear God, that the widow, the orphan, the widower, and the veteran all know the cost of war. Challenge us to love the warrior, but hate the cost of war. And we pray for a time when peace will reign and swords become plowshares once more, that war be known only in history books. And we give thanks, gracious God, that you remain with us as celebrate the service of all who dare to go forth in our name. Remind us that such service is not a movie, an adventure, or something to be glorified. Remind us that war is a failure by us to overcome hatred with love, injustice with righteousness, violence with peace. We give thanks for those who protect us from such failures. May we truly be your people and be makers of peace. Amen.
light that candle in memory of James Campbell McMeekin, United States Army. I light that candle in honor of Captain Andrew Lubert, United States Marine Corps. I light that candle in honor of Jonathan Ewing, United States uh, Army Ranger Battalion 3. I light that, that candle in honor of uh, Kerry Hawkins, Navy, United States SEALs, Unit 1. Please, as you wish, come forward. I light my candle in honor of my parents, both United States Navy and my cousin, United States Marine Corps. Light this candle in honor of my father, Donald L. Walker, U.S. Navy. this candle in remembrance <clears throat> of Uncle James Mohood, uh, U.S. Army, and my father, John Lawrence Brock, also of the U.S. Army, also in honor of Ken Kilby and Ann Kilby, U.S. Air Force. I light my candle in honor of my brother Paul Monix, U.S. Marine Corps, my uncle, a veteran of the um, Vietnam War, he was in the Army, and my friend Brian Green, who is in the Navy currently. I'd like to scandal in honor of my father, who served in World War II in the Marshall Islands, uh, Sergeant Orville W. Foster. Light that candle for my father, Loyal Westerman. U.S. Army, World War II, my uncle, Howard Garvin, World War II, I believe he was in the Air Force as a pilot. I light this candle in honor of my uh, brother, Jeff Kreider, who was retired Air Force, um, my uncles, um, Eugene Morrow, uh, U.S. Um, Marine, my uncle Mark with the Air Force, um, my uncle Jake was uh, Army, and my father. My father, Raymond C. Lenz, who's in the hospital right now, U.S. Army, retired, and uh, he's in the hospital right now fighting for his life. I light this candle in honor of my dad, who served in the United States Army, 
and also for my grandfather, who was a staff sergeant for the United States Army and served in World War II. I light this candle in honor of my grandfather, Mickey Weisgerber, who was paralyzed in World War II. for my grandpa. He served in the U.S. Army. I like this candle for Clifford Moxley, Baghdad, Iraq, 2004, and Jan Argonish, Afghanistan, 2007. I light this candle in memory of my father, Louis Verba, U.S. Air Force, and my uncle, Wesley Stewart, who served in Vietnam. May these lights burn forever. May they never go out. May we each know that God is part of each of these lights, that he has brought this light into the world, and he strengthens each of us through the efforts of those who have served us and have served him. We would ask that all who have served, be whole, be strengthened. Know that God has walked with them each and every day and that they are part of his kingdom in a very special way. My sincere thanks, our sincere thanks to all veterans. We do something in the United States is we have the freedom to worship that hundreds of millions of people around the world do not have is we can go into a public place and worship our Father God in freedom. There are cases in China where they worship but they sing in silence. They just move their hands because they don't want the authorities to overhear them and we can gather. We have the freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the freedom to worship. Thanks very much for these remembrances and to all who have served. Regarding prayers, praise, uh, prayers for the Plains Church, as you may have heard, their pastor Derek Murata has taken a call in South Carolina. Last week was his last week. So they're embarking on the journey that you're undergoing right now. So prayers for Plains Church. And my neighbor Craig um, had 14 inches of his colon removed. Uh, I guess that's about 20%, and he's doing fine. I guess he's, they just take part out, and they, I don't know. Sounds complicated, but thank, but praise God for giving us brains to do surgeries and things like that, to develop drugs, to combat tick-borne illnesses. So my, my, like I said, my neighbor, I think he's home. I think I saw his wife coming in the front door. It looked like the car was parked out front and they were bringing him in, but he's got a road to recovery. He, uh, his biggest challenge is he wants to be well enough until the, by the time the snow comes because he loves running his snowblower in the neighborhood while he's having his cigar. He's a good neighbor. Other prayers, joys, and concerns. We have uh, lots of cake mixes and frosting, so thank you to everyone, and they'll be delivered soon over to the food bank. Um, and also have a prayer for Glenn. Tomorrow morning he will have a new knee on his left side. Who's having a new knee? Oh, 
Okay. Lifetime, let's hope it's a lifetime guarantee on that knee, huh? Others? Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you that you are an awesome God. Thank you that you have created the stars in the universe and yet you count the hairs on our head. Lord God, we do a most amazing thing when we come to you and call you Father. You are our Father, and because of Jesus Christ, we are your adopted children in the family of faith. Even though we are not worthy to come before you, you allow us to approach your throne with boldness. Lord God, this day we honor veterans. Let us keep veterans in our hearts every day. The fact that we can live in the United States safely and freely because of men and women who have served many, many, many who have given the ultimate sacrifice, dying for our freedom. Let us remember those who still carry wounds, emotional, physical. Let them have healing. And Lord God, in your time, we dream of a world where armies are not necessary a world of peace and harmony. Lord God, thank you for giving us brains, as I've said, that we can operate on the human body to repair organs, to provide artificial joints that help us live life better, to provide drugs and medicines to heal us. Be with those who are now in the hospital, either awaiting a surgery or recovering or are just alone in a hospital room, be with them. Be with the nurses and the doctors and the technicians and everyone else who care for those folks. Keep them safe. Lord God, thank you for the generosity that we can provide food to a local food bank. Let us be generous givers, giving with love. Thank you for churches. Lord God, we ask this morning, we lift up the Plains Church, a neighboring body of Christ near us, but Lord God, they are without a pastor. Give them strength and courage as they embark on the journey of finding a pastor. And like us, you know who their next pastor is. That person doesn't know it, nor do we, or do they. But, or do they, but in your time, reveal that person's name. Lord God, we ask that if anyone is willing to step up to be on the pastor nominating committee, touch their hearts, bring them forward. Lord God, we pray for our nation, our communities, let us have good discourse in Washington and elsewhere, across our nation. Let us come together as one. Be one nation under God. Be with our leaders. Give them wisdom and courage. Be with this great church. Thank you for all the stuff that is done in your name, behind the scenes, anonymously by people who live out their faith, working for the body of Christ. Be with those leaders who have agreed to serve. Thank you for their call, responding to your call for service. And Lord God, bless all of us as we continue to go through life and let us live in your life. And now we lift our voices to you in unison, praying the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us give back to God his tithes and our offerings.
Lord God, you have given us so much freely and lovingly without condition. Let these gifts be a sign of our thanks and let them be used here and throughout the world that others might come to know the grace that comes free, freely and lovingly through Jesus Christ. We lift all of this up in his name. Amen. Please be seated. As it says in the bulletin, the session has called a congregational meeting for Sunday, November 21st, after worship, for the purpose of election of officers, elders, deacons, and trustees. November 21st, after worship. Other announcements from the mission field. Good morning. In order for that meeting to be of interest, we are looking for some trustees. And so if there's some interest in you joining the trustee group, please see myself or Renee Cipher, Matt DeVries, or the big show. <laughs> Additionally, we have put up the Christmas tree in the back in the chapel area for anybody who is interested in taking a tag we do have the tags available we are accepting gift cards this year for the lighthouse toy shop in the amount of $25 or you can take one of the tags that have some of the younger children of age and you can select that way the gifts I ask that if you bring them back by December the 4th as the toy shop drive begins on the 10th of December the Lighthouse is looking for volunteers on Friday the 10th of December as well as Saturday the 11th. If you're interested in helping, please let me know and I'd be happy to send that link your way. Additionally, we have the Brick campaign that continues and that will run till January the 2nd of 2022. Forms are in the back of the sanctuary or in the chapel. Thank you. Um, in your bulletin, there is an order form for personalized Christmas ornaments. Uh, Dina is making these, and the proceeds will go toward the Austin Flint um, Preschool Scholarship Fund. There are um, ornaments on the tree in the chapel that will give you an idea of what they look like. And so if you want to take a look back there, there are three ornaments that Dina has already made. Um, there will be a deacons meeting this Tuesday night um, at 7 o'clock. So for all the deacons, see you on Tuesday. And if you haven't had a chance or if you come in the back and you haven't seen the front of the church, go out and look at the uh, veterans display that's out front. Looks cool. Very nice. I might add to Chip's announcement, the... Nominating committee is looking for a few more folks to consider serving on the pastor nominating committee. Two or three more would be helpful. If you are interested, please see me or any of the transition team members. We're going to have a youth group meeting next Sunday night at 5 o'clock here at the church for our youth in grades 6 and up. Uh, we are also planning to have an in-person Christmas program for the kids this year. Uh, and that will be in December, probably on the third Sunday of Advent, I think. Uh, and we'll be practicing during the Sunday school time. So um, if you are not coming to Sunday school and you would like to be part of that, this would be the time to get started. And also, uh, as in past years, if kids want to do a solo or play an instrument, we'll be looking for people to do that as well. Thanks very much. Evidence. That, the, that Westminster Church continues to go, continues to thrive for all the hands that do God's work. Let's stand and sing our final hymn.
Now may the grace of our Father and Lord, God, God the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the grace, the saving grace of Jesus Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.